I hope someday come a time when being the first women in anything isn't news anymore because it is so, so frequent. Well, Foreign Minister, thank you so much for your time today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for having me. So you've done a lot of interviews, both mm -hmm. as an interviewer and an interviewee when it comes to humanitarian issues and other global affairs. But I'm hoping that today might be one of those few times we can light things up a little bit and get to know you a little bit more as a person mm -hmm. and talk a little bit about your personal journey mm -hmm. as a woman leader. I'm very happy to. All right, so let's get right into it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to begin with your passion for mm -hmm. global affairs. Mm -hmm. When did you first spark an interest in mm -hmm. bridging culture? Well, I guess I always grew up very curious about the world outside my own country, other countries and other, other peoples, and perhaps having a father who was a first-generation broadcaster in this country who dealt with, um, with issues outside the country was part of that. But then having an opportunity to go and study abroad uh, certainly made me much more aware of the, the diversity that's out there and how, how difficult, in fact, it is for that diversity to communicate uh, and, and, and to find harmony and in all of that. So intercultural communication was what I majored in as my PhD program in, uh, in graduate school, but I really didn't think that I would have the opportunity to practice it as, as the country's top diplomat now. You've had a very diverse career background. Mm -hmm. You started out as an English broadcaster here mm -hmm. in Korea mm -hmm. and later moved on to teaching at universities mm -hmm. and then to public service. Mm -hmm. So how would you describe your approach when mm -hmm. it comes to making those choices in mm -hmm. your career path? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'm very grateful and happy with every bit of that diverse experience that I've had. It all comes together and is now part of my, my uh, skill set in this current job. Uh, but in terms of making career choices, I, I always go for the, what is new. Um, not what promotes me, but what brings me new experiences and new challenges. And that partly explains why my, di uh, my career path is so diverse, because instead of staying in one track and, and seeing myself grow and and be promoted in that track when there was opportunity to move outside and do something new that was the choice I always made. You were often named the first woman mm -hmm. of many things. Mm -hmm. You were the first Korean woman to hold a high-level position at the United Nations mm -hmm. and now you are our very first woman foreign mm -hmm. minister of our country of South mm -hmm. Korea. Mm -hmm. Now how do you feel whenever you get that title of being the first woman? I've been wary of that title for a long, long time. I think I've had my share of being the first women of anything. And I've, uh, for a long time, I've been hoping that many other women would share that title, and, and many have. I hope someday come a time when being the first women in anything isn't news anymore because it is so, so frequent. And I'm enormously honored. but. I think we have to we have to speed up that time when you know it isn't news anymore to be the first woman in anything. And as a woman working in a lot of leadership positions, mm -hmm. what's been your biggest obstacle? I think in my generation, growing up in the 60s, 70s, and trying to make it in any career track in the 80s and 90s and so far, we've had to deal with um, you know first of all deep-seated women. Uh, discrimination against women that is very much part of our traditional culture but personally um, I I grew up in a family of just daughters um, I went to uh, junior high school and high school of girls only so within that context I felt no discrimination uh, but once you're in university and you know faced with more men than women you it immediately hits that you are dealing with a very different kind of a human being, very different species. So that was a struggle for me. But I think, per, I think now when after becoming a leader, uh, there's always this self-doubt as, you know, can I do this? Do I have it? And you also have the suspicion that am I, am I being discriminated against? Am I not getting what I deserve 
not getting my, my uh, decisions implemented because people are treating me as a woman. And so it's that both your self-doubt and, and that inhibition is something that I constantly have to remind myself as not to detract me too much. And yes, it may be, and, and maybe there are, is still discrimination, but you sort of have to move beyond that and just deal with you know, people at face value and just do your best. Throughout your career, you've had a lot of opportunities to work with all these different types of leaders from all over the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. So based on your experience, mm -hmm. how would you define good leadership? Yes, I've, I've dealt with many leaders both uh, inside the country and, and outside the country, but it's all been in public sector, so I can't speak for, for uh, the private sector. But I w could simply sum them up into a couple of categories. There are those who say, serve me, and those who say, follow me, and those who say, work with me. Um, I think my style is follow me and work with me but in order to do that, it's mundane, but leading by example, I think, is critical. Uh, I think for the leadership to be effective, you have to win the trust and respect of your crowd, your staff that you are trying to lead. Uh, you, know, you have to motivate them. You need to get the best out of them. And you can't do that unless you have their respect and their trust. And staff want a leader that they can be proud of. Um, they don't want a leader that they are ashamed of. They have to find inspiration and motivation in the leader. And I think that's best when you do it by saying, follow me, uh, but being good at what you do, but also saying, work with me. So that's, that's my approach to leadership. And I personally found that kind of leadership in, in bosses that I've worked with the best. And speaking of inspiration, a lot of young women here mm -hmm. in Korea look up to you as their role model in mm -hmm. life. Now, I would love to know, mm -hmm. uh, did you have anyone that you looked up to as a role model when you were younger? Well, I think my own father, who nurtured me with unconditional love and trust and support. I've seen how he worked, and uh, he's somebody who cared so much more for his staff than his boss and so that that was natural to me and maybe that reflects my style of leadership as well so growing up it was definitely my father but once uh, once uh, out of school there are a couple of uh, you know men and women that I found inspiration and I can name many but just to name three um, uh, Madam Lee Yeon Suk, who is retired now, but she was member of parliament and, and minister. And she was a woman leader, but always empowering of younger women leaders. She had a keen eye for talent. And when she decided you, you, you could use my support, she was fully supportive and, and very empowering. And I am still in great admiration of her. Um, President Kim Dae-jung whom I worked uh, very closely for, for about three years. Uh, a, a great listener with just immense wisdom and, and just knew how to engage with any interlocutor that came by and just, uh, you know, at the, at the end of that conversation, um, you know, everybody turning to be a fan. And then I think uh, Louise Arbor, who was the High Commissioner for Human Rights who took me into the UN system and made me her deputy. And I worked with her for about a year and a half and we're still in close touch. But I have to say, she has the sharpest mind of anybody I know. She has the ability to penetrate um, uh, any difficult issue and, and find logic in it and find a response to it. So there are many more, but uh, just a few. And here comes the more personal side of this mm -hmm. interview. Aside from being the top diplomat of our country, you're also a mother of three mm -hmm. and a wife. Mm -hmm. So how do you feel about the balance mm -hmm. between your personal and your professional life? Mm -hmm. Well, at this stage in life, I have the luxury of not having to care for my kids and, and family because they're all grown up. Uh, uh, in fact, it's the other way. They, it, they tend to take care of me than, and then, than the other way around. 
So I think now, I, I think I use 95% of my time on work and perhaps 5% usually on weekdays um, uh, enjoying the family. Uh, but that proportion of time spent on work and, and family would be very different from uh, for, for younger people, obviously, with young kids. Um, and you just need to f find a way to balance that. And time allocation is extremely important. There has to be the work-life balance that women should not be discriminated against because of their family duties and obligations, that men have to share that equally. And uh, child uh, leave uh, should not result in, in women falling behind uh, in their career tracks after they come back from those leaves. So uh, for personally, it's, it's, uh, it's not an issue for me anymore. But I do know that it is a huge issue and a challenge for, for men and women um, with uh, young families. And since we're all human, mm -hmm. we sometimes make mistakes and mm -hmm. things don't always work out mm -hmm. the way we want. Mm -hmm. So when you're faced with these setbacks mm -hmm. in life, um, do you have any tips on how to deal with them? Well, on mistakes, I think I go back and think carefully, was it really my mistake uh, or is it due to somebody else's? But if it's clearly my mistake, I, I come to terms with it. I acknowledge it as my mistake to myself and, and those affected and, and take responsibility for that. Um, but setbacks can happen regardless of what you do or don't do, regardless of any fault on your own. Um, but I think the wisdom of you know, surviving those setbacks and coming out at the end uh, stronger is, to, is to, sil to see the silver lining in every situation. And I think looking back, uh, I think it was, you know, those darkest moments in my life. And there have been periods of real personal difficulty and challenges um, that, you know, was, was also a period for, for self-growth. What's your biggest motivation that drives you in life? I think growing up, um, making sure that my parents are proud of me. Uh, later in life with a family of my own, making sure that my children are, part of, uh, are very proud of me. Uh, but now um, I think it's, it's um, you know, make, you know, starting off the day trying to be a uh, force for the good side of humanity because you see the bad side um, in so many different manifestations. So what is good, what is bad is very subjective, but at least uh, you can have your own sense of um, what is right uh, and, and a moral anchor build upon that and try to uh, act in a way that, you know, that, that adds to that goodness rather than damages it. So before we wrap up this interview, mm -hmm. I want to ask for your advice for all the young women out mm -hmm. there who are hoping to go out into the world someday and do bigger things. Mm -hmm. Could you offer them a few words of wisdom? I'd say always try to expand your horizon. Be curious, which means don't be lazy because you can't be curious and be lazy at the same time. And to do a lot of good reading, uh, good books, good articles beyond the, the tidbits of information that you pick up on the internet. Um, so I always carry a couple of books around me. Well, Foreign Minister, thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, Korea Now, on breaking 10,000 in subscription in three months of operation. I wish you growth in leaps and bounds so that you become a trusted channel of information about happenings here in Korea to the global audience.